Hello and welcome back in the workshop channel. You are right now here in the workshop channel with uh, the glaucoma session and in the following 90 minutes Andreas will share us share with us um, the acquisition of the glaucoma scans with the spectralis OCT show uh, some acquisitions with the anterior segment module like uh, the cornea scan and um, anterior chamber angle scan and afterwards he will present how to interpret the images in the software and for examples of glaucoma patients and neuropathologies we will have uh, our dear colleague Martin from UK who shares a lot of really interesting um, patients with us. So, so then let me pass over to Andreas again and we'll enjoy his glaucoma lecture. Yeah, thank you Matthias. And with not losing time, we will immediately start with my dear colleague Henry. And I will show you first, as Matthias already said, the glaucoma examination. So as always, I normally tell the patient not to sit in front so fast, but that's okay. <laughs> because if I still keep talking, then he has to sit all the time in front of the camera and I don't want him to sit too long. So what I first do is to start the scan. So I place the order like Jenny already told you before. We are using the order glaucoma, so in Germany glaucoma. And operator is my name in. I save and start. And before we start the um, glaucoma, med, um, glaucoma module premium edition, we normally want you to type in the C-curve of your patient's uh, cornea. Um, in this case, I know that Henry, well, approximately might have 7.7, .7, right? <laughs> and we just leave it uh, at the standard. So normally, um, we, would, we recommend to, to type in the right value because due to the um, refraction that we uh, use with the, with the focusing of the, of the retina and the C-curve of the, of the cornea of the patient, the software is able to uh, roughly um, calculate the length of the eye and then we will have a better positioning of the scans. But I will tell you that later on. So we go on with the 7.7 .7, and if we don't type in anything and the patient is brand new in our um, software, then the software asks us again if I don't want to type it in, and in this case, I want to continue. And then we come immediately in the uh, acquisition window, and that's the time when I ask the patient to come in front, try to align the table, and maybe ask the patient if he sits as comfortable as possible. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Perfect. Okay, Henry's fine with it, and we start the camera, and we start with an OCT as well. Always the same, what Grit already told you, we start with um, positioning the bright circle in the middle, come closer to the patient's eye, and try to illuminate the picture on the left-hand side, so the fundus image, as well as the OCT image, as good as possible. What I always uh, do, or how I always start is to um, ask the patient to look really centered in the camera. Normally, if you could imagine, if we take some uh, glaucoma measurements, we often measure the optic nerve head, and therefore we position the fixation target to the nasal position. But if I would start with the position nasally, then the patient might have problems if I am too far away with the camera to see the fixation light. So I always recommend to start with a very center position, and then you as well have a nicer positioning and the patient has a more comfortable uh, fixation position and you can as well have a look on the on the retina how it looks and you can um, put the focus as perfectly as possible in the area surrounding the fovea. So let's see how the focus is set. I normally start with the zero and then go roughly um, plus minus one and then go a little bit closer steps. Over here, everything looks fine. Then we switch the application from retina to glaucoma because we want to measure the glaucoma um, scan. And then I start with the optic nerve head radial circle scan. Normally, I would expect this measurement not um, to show up because I thought I started the patient brand new, but as it looks, somebody already used this patient. So therefore, I already give you one tip 
for your practice. Um, if you already started the centering of the Brooks membrane opening and the anatomic axis that I wanted to do um, now, um, then you can start it again because in this case we could say um, Henry is my colleague and we are trying to train how it works and therefore um, we select the position left top setup and then I can redefine the anatomic landmarks for the anatomic positioning system. As I just saw, I took the wrong patient, so that might make sense. So that was my mistake, sorry so far. I already took the patient that I wanted to show you afterwards. So we just start by typing in the right patient, selecting the right patient, <laughs> and then go all the way to the measurement. Sorry for that mistake. So there we are again. Patient looks perfectly straight, same position like before. I select the glaucoma application and then you can see what I wanted to show you. The optic norofed radial circle scan is the one that looks like a wheel and the three letters A, P and S are red and that means that we start from the very beginning. What I am doing right now. So I click on the icon, then the fixation target is moving from center to nasal. You can immediately see that the, uh, that the image gets worse. That's because my patient is very helpful or very nice to me. He already looks um, to the fixation target how I normally wanted um, him to do. If you have patients who have problem seeing the fixation target, you always can hold your hand next to the patient's open eye and then he can see the fixation target in your open eye. Or you as well could ask the patient to, to hold his own hand um, in front of his open eye because then it's easier to see the fixation target in the camera. But what you have to do is to move the camera slightly to the nasal position of the patient to illuminate the picture perfectly and then have a close look if the structure surrounding the optic nerve head is sharp enough. Otherwise you can focus again because the main structure that we want to measure is the optic nerve head surrounding RNFL, so the retinal nerve fiber layer, and that's the very top surface layer. Um, and therefore, I try to focus on this very strong reflections um, that are surrounding the vessels. And if I can see these very sharp information over here, then I'm quite satisfied with it, and then start the um, anatomic axis positioning system. And this works. If we have a look on the bottom right over here in four steps. So the first step is to tell the software to start the fovea detection. If I click on that one, then I just have to wait. And in most cases, you can see the fovea positioning like we have it on top. So it's perfectly in the center of the fovea um, condition. So we have that, um, that hills on the left and right and the valley on the middle. And we want to have the blue line perfectly in the valley. And the uh, next hint um, to see the perfect fovea configuration is if you follow the um, retinal structures from left to the center and from right to the center, then you have one specific position where the retinal structures seem to disappear. And that's the area where we don't have any vessels in the fovea and where the fovea position should be in the center part. And the last hint that you can follow is that a very small hill on bottom where the retin retinal pigment epithelium uh, is a little bit um, higher than in the surrounding area. So these three hints might help you to find the perfect location, especially when the patient um, has not such a great looking uh, fovea like Henry's is. So we can perfectly see in this um, healthy eye that it's really easy to find, but it might be a little bit harder if you have um, like an edema or ischemic areas surrounding on atrophy um, and, the, and the software is always detecting the thinnest point of the retina. So that means if the fovea isn't anymore the thinnest point, it might be the case that the software will not find it automatically and therefore you have to help the software a little bit. 
on the bottom one, we could discuss where we would put it. I would say we put a little bit to the right. What you shouldn't um, always perfectly try to find or try to um, select is this black information over here. This black information um, in most patients is the position where the pac patients fixate. So the, we could say the, the position where the, um, where the light is perfectly um, vertically um, um, showing up on the retina. And if you have patients who not perfectly um, fixate on the, on the target, then it might be that this black position is not in the center. So don't um, rely to this black point, always check the configuration. And if I moved one of these uh, vertical lines, the software asks me if the other one is uh, still right. So the top one is um, showing up red. And if I control it and want to move it, then I just click on the position where I need it. But in some time, uh, in, uh, at the end of your configuration check, you really have to click on the line itself. Because if you click a little bit to the left or to the right, then the other one will show up red. And you can do this the whole day long uh, till you really click on one uh, of, the, of the lines. So you have to perfectly select the line if it's, if it's correct. And then you can confirm this position. Therefore, in the third step, the cross moves from the fovea to the optic nerve head. And if you might have some um, structures that are not perfectly centered like over here, if you have maybe a myopic patient like I am, it might be that this cross is not perfectly set in the, in the center of the optic nerve head. And then you might help the software by moving it to the center part, click on start BMO detection, and then wait. Always have your hands on the camera to slightly move it to the perfect illumination position. And then you need four informations to, um, to confirm or to check. So I normally start at the top left. And if we are very critical, we could try to find a better position a little bit to the right. So we follow the bottom black line. And as you can see, the patient sometimes is a little bit bored um, by just looking straight. And so you have to wait until um, the patient uh, stops blinking and stops uh, looking somewhere else. But that's totally normal. And I follow the bottom black line, so the Brooks membrane, and I'm checking if the end of the Brooks membrane, so the Brooks membrane opening, is at the position where the blue vertical uh, dots are. I do that at the right-hand side as well. And in here you can see that we have sometimes problems at the optic nerve head to perfectly analyze the Brooks membrane opening. Because the Brooks membrane opening might be a little bit um, blurry at the areas where the blood vessels are very large um, above it. And the blood vessels, as we know, don't let the light through like we would like to have it in the retina. And therefore, we have to look very close or rely on the software. Because the software is um, very sensitive for the white and gray shattering. And therefore, in most cases, the software has a little bit more um, expertise to select the right position. And in this case, I would um, agree with the software. On bottom right, I would be quite sure to uh, move it a little bit to the left hand side, on the left bottom part, I would say that's quite okay. And then if I click on confirm, then we have the perfect anatomic positioning. So we have the fovea position and the center of the optic nerve head because of the Brooks membrane opening. And this axis will be the same position all the time. So even if my patient looks a little bit up, down, left or right, thank you. <laughs> The position will follow. So that's perfectly the same what you just saw with the follow-up measurements that we took. So this axis is the individual axis that we are using for the patient that we have here at the moment. And it will not um, fit to another patient, even to another eye um, of the same patient. It will not fit. And this is extremely um, important because with this axis, you will later on see that we can perfectly align the segments and the analyzes uh, with the normative database. So now I want my patient to look very stable. I start the eye tracking mode and then acquire the scan. And now I just wait till the scan is completely done. Ask my patient to blink as often as he wants to. 
And what I would recommend you to do is to have enough space between the, um, the ILM and the border over here because um, even slightly um, changes in the patient's positions or if the patient breathes very, um, very hard or very, very uh, strong, it might move the, the OCT position very high. And if we have one position where the ILM is not um, perfectly in the, um, in the frame that we are measuring, then we, you might not be able to use this measurement as a baseline measurement. And especially the baseline measurement is more or less the most important because in the future we will compare all the scans with the baseline. So if we have a bad baseline uh, measurement, um, we will not be able to really perfectly um, analyze um, glaucoma detachment. So this scan is already over. As a next scan, we always recommend to use the posterior pole scan horizontally. Therefore, the patient um, should look straight again because the fixation target again moves to the central part. And as we are talking about glaucoma, in most cases, we talk about measurements surrounding the optic nerve head. But this posterior pole measurement is an analysis that gives us the possibility to compare the superior with the inferior part of the patient itself. So we again start the eye tracking and start the acquisition. Same over here. We try to be a little bit off from the very top position because we have a high quality OCT2 over here. So we have a little bit more space um, for good information and that's it. So if the um, measurement is over, we can go back. Normally we would use again uh, the same functionality on the other eye. But we first of all check um, all the information that we just took. And that's it. So these would be the recommended measurements that uh, we normally take, um, always um, depending on the patient's detachment or the patient's ability to look straight. There are some more uh, other scans that we could perform, maybe some faster scans or maybe some different scans um, always compared to the detachments that we see but we'll first check what we just took over here. So you can see that we have two measurements taken. The first one is the optic nerve head radial circle scan. And you can see that we um, already have a reference. So that means because of the APS, so the anatomic positioning system has taken place, the software knows that this has to be the very first measurement. So in these cases, the software automatically positions um, the reference position on this scan. And if we open that scan, we would check in the display tab if we have a good quality. So that means on the one hand side, we have, uh, if we have a good infrared image, we can enlarge that a little bit. And if you use your functionality um, uh, position, um, the F6 button on your keyboard, you can um, select or deselect the positions of the OCT. So if you want to have a look of the, for the focus of the optic nerve head, you can click on the F6 button on your keyboard and the, uh, the positioning line disappears. But at the moment, I want to check if all my measurements are of good quality and if they um, are completely in the, in the field where I want them to have. So these are perfectly fine. And the next one is the posterior pole measurement. And in this one, I would as well check the display position, if we can see it. And this is just a very large scan, um, like the dense scan, but a little bit wider, um, like we had it before, and a little bit more in the height. And as well in this scan, we have a good quality. We have all the information that we need. And that's enough for the quality check for me at the moment. All the other analyzers will um, be shown later on. What I want you to show in the meantime, before we start the analysis, is a um, additional measurement. And as you can see, I already moved the camera, the, uh, the focus knob, so that I have a little bit more space over here. What you can see just in a second, there we are. So if I change the focus position over here, I can enlarge the field for the next module. And the next module, will be the anterior segment module. And the anterior segment module comes as well in this lovely wooden box. I take off the 30-degree lens, 
take out the blue lens. That blue lens is always the anterior segment module. The anterior segment module has a red dot as all our modules or our lenses. And then we go back in the examination, start or continue the examination at this point so I can immediately go on. And if I then start the acquisition window, you will see that we don't have a focus value, so we don't have a refraction value, but we have a position value. And this position um, value um, is um, at the moment red, and red means it's out of the range that we are uh, using, because the range that we are using is between 0.99 and plus and minus, but we would always recommend you to try to set as perfectly um, as possible on the zero. So C point zero 0.06 is quite nice, and at the moment I cannot get it better, so I start the, um, I start the OCT. And you have to know if you use the anterior segment module, the fixation target in the camera is not really visible for the patient because we have a, a, a very different focus with this lens and therefore the fixation target in the camera is not working anymore for the patient. He can see a blurry red light but that's not really good to see and therefore we are using this external um, fixation target and I want the patient just to look on this external fixation target. And as we hopefully have a patient that is able to move his eyes in both directions the same way I can easily move um, Henry's eye on the open eye and the other eye will follow perfectly. So the next step is the same like we had before, a little bit harder because we don't see a bright white light like we have it in the retina measurements. We can see if we are close enough and the patient blinks that the eye opens and closes. And that's the very first step that you are taking. Uh, um, the next step is if you can see this white circle information, put it in the center and then slightly move the camera forward because with this lens you might see it in the, um, in the camera image if Tom is um, fading a bit out perfectly. That the distance is a little bit um, smaller like we have it with the 30 degree lens or especially with the HMM and therefore you should um, be a little bit more um, um, sensitive. All right, so what we are able to measure with the anterior segment module is the anterior segment, as it's called, and we can switch the application between cornea, sclera, and angle. And we will start with the cornea measurement because in a lot of cases it's quite interesting to see how thick the cornea is and then um, compare this thickness to normal values and maybe um, recalculate your IOP measurements, okay? So that's the reason why we might use it combined with the um, glaucoma measurement. And what I would recommend is to not use the whole line like you can see over here because um, other like the retina that is quite flat, um, the cornea has a real hard curvature. So that means the wider we measure to the, to the periphery, the harder the curvature is and therefore like you can see on the top information over here, um, it's a little bit hard to see all the structures with the spectral domain OCT. So that means if I measure the whole um, distance of the, of the OCT uh, line scan, then I will have hard times to see what is happening in the surrounding area. And because I want to measure the center position and only the corneal thickness in the center, it's easier if you use the scan with the eight millimeter length that is called scan 8, and then position the scan where you want it. Um, what you can uh, select as well is the position um, that is showing up over here where we normally have the eye length button. Um, in this case we have the anterior chamber depth button, so that means at the moment we have an anterior chamber of 2.0 millimeters and I can switch between 4 and 2 in steps of 0.5 millimeters. And what I want to perfectly align this um, on is the iris structure because the better we can see the iris structure, the better the eye tracking would work. 
because the eye tracking is focusing on the iris structure and you can see the smaller the aqueous depth is or the anterior chamber depth is, the worse the image gets. So 3.5 looks quite nice for me in this case. And then I place the scan where I want it, start the eye tracking mode. And if you can see this artifact information, I would try to position the scan a little bit more beneath or above this white information because we don't want this hard reflection in the center. I acquire the scan and that's it. Same like before, with the OCT shift technology, you can vary between 125 um, scans per second. 125,000, sorry, <laughs> it's a little bit more. And therefore the measurement will be a little bit faster. But if you have problems with um, structures that are very blurry or have a bad tear film, it might be very interesting to use, especially at the anterior segment where we um, sometimes have problems with detachments that we want to see, to use the 20 kilohertz uh, measurement. But as you can see, we need the patient to look very stable on the fixation target, what is not always easy. But if it works, then we might get way better images than with the normal 85 um, kilohertz. All right. Next thing that we could use it for is the, the volume scan. Um, volume scans are um, very good if you want to measure a larger size, same like in the retina, but you always have to have in mind that the, the larger the field is, the larger the number of scans is, the lower the quality normally is, or the lower the, uh, the optimizing factor is that we normally use, uh, because we want to have a fast measurement and therefore um, the higher we use the scan um, position at a, the, the scan size, the lower the quality is. So that means if I use this small scan over here, the small volume scan, I position it on the bottom position a little bit um, beneath the pupil because it might be easy in some cases to see if there is any keratoconus happening. Important that the patient looks very stable on the fixation target and then we can start the measurement. And if you have a look on the live image on bottom, then you might have seen that the live image is um, moving very fast because the curvature of the cornea is in each of the scans different. And that means I have to be very fast in changing the position of the, of the camera. Or I would always recommend you, if you have one specific position, to use the line scan because the line scan is always of best quality and therefore better position one or two scans on a specific area and then have better qualities like you have um, a higher scan volume but maybe a lot of scans that are off the, uh, the measurement. The next application is the sclera application and the sclera application as the name is already saying it is important if we want to measure the sclera and therefore it's not possible that the patient looks straight because with the sclera measurement, we want to measure the sclera and it is off the center. So you could, as um, one step, just let the patient fixate to a um, peripheral position or if you have the luxus or the, the chance to move your camera like I have it in here, I could easily change the camera. And the great thing is, if you can see if I have the camera straight before the eye or in front of the eye, um, then the the OCT scan is diagonal and if I move the camera then I get a more or less horizontal scan position over here. Same like before, I would recommend you to use the line scan as well. I would position it on the area that is interesting, start the eye tracking, hope that the patient perfectly looks on the area that I want and then acquire. And you could as well measure this information if you might be interested in the iris structure because the iris is a little bit deeper than the cornea and if we use the sclera information it might be helpful if you have any detachments in the iris then you easily could use the sclera application, move your scan position like you want it and then you might be able to see any cysts in the iris or detachments. And last but not least we have the angle application and the angle application as well is important or interesting for patients with glaucoma because there you can measure 
the anterior chamber angle in one direction. Um, the anterior chamber angle might be measured in a one position, like we can have it over here. So the one ACA is the measurement where we um, just get an image of one anterior chamber angle. And the two ACAs is the measurement of both anterior chamber angles. If you really want the value of the anterior chamber angle, you always have to have the two ACAs because this is the only uh, measurement where uh, we can measure the anterior chamber angle. And as you can see, I am moving the external fixation light a little bit to left and right because on the top position, we need in this very small area the best positioning of both anterior chamber angles. So that means I have to tell my patient to look a little bit left and right, or I could use the camera and move it, and then place the iris on the very bottom that we can see the anterior chamber angle left and right. And you, you can see it's not that perfectly stable, so we have to be fast. And as well, it might be quite helpful if you need a lot of information because sometimes the anterior chamber angle is hard to see, it might be helpful to use the 20 kilohertz measurement to get a little bit more information. And we can compare that afterwards. It takes a little bit more time, especially at the anterior segment where the um, eye tracking has hard times to position the scan perfectly because compared to the retina we have a different structure and the iris structure is not that um, stable like the, the retinal structure is for the, uh, for the eye tracking. So, let us see what we just measured. So additionally to our uh, glaucoma scans, we have the anterior segment scans as well. And just in some seconds, we should see them over there in the software. And as you can see um, on the red top, we always have the application information. So COR is cornea, SCL, sclera, and ACA, anterior chamber angle. And if we open up the scan, then we can easily see where we positioned the scan and where the information is. And if I enlarge the OCT and I want to measure the thickness of the cornea, I would as well enlarge the OCT over there as large as possible then position the screen line perfectly in the center. So normally we would try to position it as well perfectly in the center of the pupil, but we have this hard reflex, so therefore I was a little bit lower. And now I could use my measurement tools. Uh, not. <laughs> okay, so maybe we check in the next image. Okay, so here we don't have any measurement. Um, tools, a little bit hard. Or don't I see it? No, okay. Everybody's shaking their head. <laughs> that doesn't mean that I have the problem. So maybe there's a little bit, a little problem with the software, but that's um, not a big deal. So it's more or less the same like we do it in the, in the Retina application. So I just show you in the Retina application where we have the measurement tools. It's over here. So normally I would use this measurement tool. And if we think about this is the cornea, I would just select the start point and the end point, and then we would think about if this is the cornea, it would be very thin, but this cornea might be like 550, so the mean value, okay? If we go on through all these information, then we can see that the information of the cornea is more or less the same, till we come to the point where we have the volume scan. And the volume scan normally has less information and that's, again, the reason why I would recommend you to use the line scan. The closer we come to the, uh, to the center, the harder it was for me to position the scan because I was um, a little bit less accurate in the measurement and I maybe talked too much during the measurement. And the more centered we are, the better the quality is. So the, the more off we are from the center, the less um, the quality is over here. If we go on, same with the sclera, so you can see here how perfectly and high quality images we can get of the sclera and of all the structures over here. And you will later on see 
how that changes with anterior, that we have a way wider angle or way wider range that we can see, but the high quality um, of the spectral domain OCT is very unique compared to the swept source OCT, as well as we have the structure of the iris over here that we can perfectly see. In the anterior chamber measurement, we could on the one hand side see how nicely we can um, imagine uh, imaging the, um, the anterior chamber over here and normally would be able to measure the anterior chamber over here. So I normally would enlarge the scan over here and put different points on the scleral spur, backside of the cornea, um, anterior chamber angle recess point and the backside at uh, the front of the iris. And then I would automatically get an impression how wide the angle is. So with your um, experience, you could easily say that this um, anterior chamber angle is quite wide. So we could say it's between 30 and 40 degree, for example. And that's what we can measure and see with the anterior chamber angle. And now I would like to show you a little bit more of the analysis of the glaucoma software. So what we already did was um, checking the quality of the OCT. So we were happy or I was happy with the quality. I hope you were happy as well. Um, and normally if we start analyzing the glaucoma measurement, the software starts with the Brooks membrane rim analysis tab. And the reason therefore is this little warning sign over here. And this little warning sign doesn't mean that the measurement was not good enough because we checked it together and I was happy, you were happy, or nobody else did say anything else. And now I have to check the Brooks membrane opening points. And that's the warning that comes up. So the software always wants you to check the end of the Brooks membrane because the end of the Brooks membrane um, is important for the center of the analysis. So all these red points over here are ends of Brooks membrane and the Brooks membrane opening position is the same over here. And these red points are the positions that we try to analyze or try to check. And if we go through all these information, I always check right and left if the red point is right. And I would recommend you to start at the position one, because there is one specific point that changes the information in the analysis window totally, because if we move from one to 25, uh, 24, sorry, the position superior and inferior changes. So that is the reason, because we have a circle or a radial scan that is more or less 360 degree. And if you only look on the OCT and not follow the information on top left and right, then you might lose um, um, the, the information that you just flipped the information. So I normally start at the point one and check if on the left and right hand side the red point is on the right position. If we go on and on, we do more or less the same like we did in the examination or the acquisition before. And in all cases, I would say I'm super happy with the software because all of the red points are at the very end of the Brooks membrane. Might be as well because we have a really healthy eye, a quite easy to see Brooks membrane opening. And if you um, think about why the, the, um, the orientation of the, of the arrows is not always the same, for example, over here, on the one hand side, it moves to the right, on the next, it moves a little bit more to the left then the reason might be that we have a lot of blood vessels at the optic nerve head. And the software always detects the Brooks membrane opening. And from the Brooks membrane opening, it measures the shortest distance. And the shortest distance might be a little bit more to the right or to the left. But it's very important that we have the shortest distance because then we have one stable value. So not um, if we say we measure only the horizontal position, so from the Brooks membrane opening um, horizontal to the end of the ILM might be not that um, stable or that um, good to, to follow up like the position with the minimum rim width. So as we are happy with all these points, we could easily confirm this or if we want to change the end point, then we can click on the edit button over here 
and easily double click on the end of the area where we want it to have. And you as well can see if we have made any changes like I did, we can see that the histogram over there differs from the normative um, rate or from the normative way it would follow. And therefore, if you see some information like this, if it goes very high up or very low, like you can see over here, these spikes, then normally there is a mismatch in the measurement or a mismatch in the segmentation. And these are points that you have to control um, very, um, very effectively. You always see what was changed manually or modified. So this small m um, beneath the red dot means that you have modified it. If I close the um, editor, I can save my changes or I can redo them. The same uh, can be made for the um, segmentation of the, of the ILM. And this is the same like you can use um, with the retina functionality. So if I want to change the green line over here, I can erase it and use a new point to complete it again. Or I easily could use this ball over here to just push everything to another direction. So we close that over here and then we can see the histogram over here follows perfectly. The green line is a little bit more um, above it. Um, the next interesting parameter is the BMO overview. And the BMO overview is just, as it says, an overview of 12 examples of all 48 measurements. And if they are green, like we have it over here, then it's in the normal range. If we click on the RNFL thickness, we expect the histogram to be like we have it over here. So the black line follows almost perfectly the green line. That is the normative database and always calculated for this patient uh, specific on the Brooks membrane opening area and the age of the patient. And if we would have some more measurements, we could see the um, progression. Then we have a closer look on the posterior pole measurement. The first thing is the posterior pole measurement over here. And what the posterior pole measurement does is to compare the superior value with the inferior value. And the software tells me that these points over here, so these three squares over here, differ from the points that we have on top. So these three positions over here are thicker than the values over here. And that might be the reason that we have a thicker blood vessel over here that changes the whole measurement. And therefore, um, we can say that these areas over here just uh, differ from the normative way or from the from the symmetrical way because of this um, blood vessel. But to not talk in too much, I would lovely um, give back to the UK and see if Martin is already there. And he will for sure have a lot more interesting cases for you, hopefully. Yeah, I know Martin is there. And thank you very much, Andy, for your presentation. And maybe we can show Martin's camera image as well. <laughs> Hi, Martin. Great to see you. So, <laughs> yeah, we can hear you very good. Great. Oh, good. So, Martin, so for, for those who don't know Martin right now, Martin is our Director of Professional Education in the Heidelberg Engineering Academy. And everybody in the world who sells OCT systems from Heidelberg should know Martin and his lectures. So. <laughs> We can't wait for, for your examples that uh, you collected and for your great cases um, that you always show. So you have really a lot of time. So Andy um, okay, um, has, has let you a few minutes more than you yeah, uh, should if, have. If you want, I can I could add a progression case. I didn't include a progression, but I can do a progression if somebody, if you would think it's useful for me to show progression. Uh, I'm showing... Uh, classic glaucoma, early glaucoma, a preparametric, and then a moderate glaucoma, uh, and then a couple of uh, neuro cases. So maybe there's time. If you want, I could show something yeah. else as well. So, so you can really take your time until 5 to 5 European time. So, okay. But now, Martin, I would ask you to share your screen 
and okay. then show your great cases. All right, let me try and do that for you. There we go. Can you see? Uh, can you see my desktop there with the cases loaded? Yeah, we see your Hayex, and great. I think now okay. it should work. Okay, great. Um, so let's start uh, first of all with a, a classic glaucoma case, so that uh, to give you the idea how we would uh, systematically uh, evaluate an eye uh, with our software from the point of view of glaucoma. Um, Probably you're aware that if you right click on any of the OCT icons here, you can extract the fundus image. And I do this routinely because uh, I don't have the benefit maybe of having uh, looked on the patient uh, physically on a slit lamp uh, to know what the optic nerve looks like. Um, and from an imaging perspective, uh, you know that this is an infrared reflectance image, uh, confocal scanning laser. It's a diagnostic image. Um, and so I can see healthy nerve fiber is very bright and highly reflective up here. And sick nerve fiber is dull. So probably you can see there's a focal nerve fiber defect here exiting the optic nerve inferiorly. Um, so that's the first thing that I look for. Is there any nerve fiber defect present? Uh, the second thing, you can see uh, the disc very clearly. Uh, and you can see the neuroretinal rim because this is a nice reflectance image. And I can see that there's some notching here inferiorly where that uh, damaged nerve fiber is exiting the optic nerve. Uh, and I can also have an assessment, let's say, of the vertical cup disc ratio. If I think about cup disc ratio, and this patient looks to be uh, at least borderline 0 0.5, 0 0.6, maybe more. But certainly uh, it's obvious there's some notching there. So um uh, no need to worry about cup disc ratio for this particular patient. The other thing that is important to look on is what does the vessel trunk look like? And typically, um, uh, it, the normal position is like a C curve. And that dictates the uh, profile that you see of the double hump when you look on the nerve fiber layer. Uh, and if this uh, these vessel trunk is, is slightly out of position anatomically, um, you could have flagging up uh, some borderline or some outside normal limits classification just because of the change of anatomy compared to normal. So, for example, if the patient had a very vertical vessel trunk like this, um, you would have the effect of having the hump squeezed together and you might flag up with, uh, with defects on the classification. And it's got nothing to do with glaucoma. It's simply uh, an anatomic variant. So you should be aware and look, pay, pay attention really to the, to the vessel trunk just first of all, um, to see what's going on there. Now, we take a systematic approach in our interpretation. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at the neuroretinal rim uh, with the radial scan. Then we're going to look at the classic circle scan and look at the peripapillary nerve fiber layer. And we're going to look at the uh, profile and shape of the nerve fiber layer particularly, and also the thickness values. And if I would follow the axons round, we're then going to do step three, which is a complete posterior pole scan, where we can segment all of the layers of the retina and look particularly on the ganglion cell layer. Um, so that's the idea in principle. Um, I also make reference to the confocal multicolor scan that we have here, because the combination of these three different laser wavelengths you probably know creates a very good diagnostic structural imaging map. Um, and it's very good for showing uh, nerve fiber layer defect. So you can see that focal nerve fiber layer defect there, um, certainly being picked up by the short wavelength blue and green lasers, but even the infrared is showing it very nicely as well. Um, and if you compare that to a uh, standard color fundus picture, uh, I'm not an expert looking at color fundus pictures, but I really struggle to see the nerve fiber defect in this color image here compared to what I can see in my confocal multicolor image. I can see there's a hemorrhage in the fundus picture, but uh, so all is not well. But uh, from a nerve fiber layer point of view, confocal multicolor shows it up beautifully. Now, let's look at the OCT systematically. And uh, we're going to start with the neuroretinal rim. And we go to the rim analysis, the BMO rim analysis. And he's just shown you um, where the BMO comes from. We do this radial scan with 24 
uh, radial scans, and we identify 48 locations of Brooks membrane opening here, which should be the true anatomic disc margin. And from that Brooks membrane opening location, we measure the minimum amount of neuroretinal rim tissue, the minimum rim width to the inner limiting membrane or the surface of the retina. Uh, and if I go around the optic nerve, you can see these are a little bit like uh, calipers on a pinball machine. Uh, if you like, and we're picking up the shortest distance. Um, it could be almost vertical, it could be horizontal. Um, and if you think about observing your patient uh, and looking on their disc on the slit lamp, you're looking in this direction, but with the OCT, we're looking down in cross section through here. Uh, and so you may be forgiven for thinking the health of the eye and, and the amount of neural, uh, neuro, uh, neuroretinal rim is across here. Uh, but you'd be possibly overestimating the health of the eye because you're cutting obliquely through those axons as they exit the optic nerve. So the idea of this radial scan is that it's a much more objective way uh, to measure thinning of the neuroretinal rim. Um, and if you think about cut disc ratio, we look for uh, vertical cupping relative to the size of the disc and there's no anatomic position for the cup it's actually created by thinning of the new of the rim here superiorly this thick bundle of fibers or inferiorly down here and that's what's creating this vertical uh, cup uh, to start getting larger um, so the idea of this uh, radial scan is that we uh, cut out the subjectivity of cup disc ratio uh, and we look to the neuroretinal rim as the cause of that cup disc ratio. So it should be a, a more objective measure and particularly looking at progression because everybody knows it's very hard to identify whether a patient is changing uh, in a small way if you just look at cup disc ratio. Now from these 48 locations of Brooks membrane opening, we get the size of the disc according to the anatomy. And this is called Brooks membrane opening area here. And this patient has got a a disc size, if you like, of 1.94 millimeters squared. And that would be considered an average size disc. And if I have an average size disc, I would expect my patient to ha have a, a, a neuroretinal rim that follows uh, this green line in the middle of the normative data. Uh, well, unfortunately, this patient doesn't. They've got a depression here, kind of nasal superior, and they've got another depression here, uh, deeper depression, temporal inferior, which is outside normal limits. Uh, and if you think about it, that correlates with exactly the same location that we've seen that focal nerve fiber defect on the infrared uh, reflectance image. Um, and you may be thinking, well, why, are, why isn't he talking about the sector analysis here? Because that's what we typically look on. Uh, and I have to tell you that this sector analysis, I'm not a big fan of it because these sectors are very large and they can absorb and average out small defects uh, that you might see on the profile. Uh, and so if you're not looking on the profile of either the rim or the nerve fiber layer, then I would encourage you to start looking on the profile because these are more sensitive than the sector analysis that you see over here. Um, and from an OCT perspective, thinking about glaucoma, I usually say three strikes and you're out. Uh, and this is the first strike. I don't like the look of the profile of this neuroretinal rim uh, from a point of view of glaucoma. Uh, so one strike for this patient, I'm afraid. Let's look now step two at the nerve fiber layer. Uh, the beauty of your spectralis compared to any other OCT is that you can see very, very clearly the tissue of the nerve fiber layer here. And you can see that the machine has segmented it properly. We're not picking up any uh, vitreous membrane up here to give us an artificially thick measure and we also can see that the base of the nerve fiber has been segmented properly so you get used to looking uh, at these beautiful images uh, and we're not really seeing a double hump situation that we would expect superiorly and inferiorly and particularly inferiorly it's very very thin here so although it looks okay over here in terms of the profile when we get to the temporal inferior area here we've got a large chunk out of our temporal inferior hump. Uh, it's sufficiently large to flag up in this case uh, on the sector analysis, but that is consistent with what we've seen in terms of this depression on the neuroretinal rim, and it's consistent again with this focal defect that we've seen 
uh, on the infrared fundus image. So from an OCT perspective, two strikes for this patient, I'm afraid. Um, don't like the look of this uh, nerve fiber layer profile at all. Finally, we'll go to step three, uh, and we look at the posterior pole scan, and we look at thickness maps. So this is all about uh, recognizing patterns. OK, um, and if we look at our full retina thickness map here, our posterior pole, uh, as long as you haven't got retina conditions to disrupt all of the layers, um, you're going to start to see patterns of damage that might relate to glaucoma. Or sometimes you might see patterns that are different and relate to non-glaucomatous optic neuropathy. So you can start to discriminate glaucoma from other optic neuropathies, uh, which is really a very good uh, thing to look on. If you look on this particular eye, we can see uh, purple colors here, which indicate thin retina. Uh, and the hot colors, the, the red and yellow, indicate thick retina. So we can see that the sea seems to have come in and flooded the land here. We've got some thinning down here. Uh, and we almost can see that focal nerve fiber defect, like a, like a purple river going to the lake there. Uh, and if you follow those axons around, we can see some notching of our ganglion cell here. And typically in glaucoma, uh, it's inferior to the horizontal midline. So it, it adheres to the horizontal midline more often inferiorly, but sometimes superiorly as well. Um, and we look at the principle of a symmetry, in other words, imbalance between the upper hemifield and the lower hemifield. And this is a principle that was adopted um, by uh, visual fields and the Humphrey Field Analyzer. Uh, and on the Humphrey Field Analyzer, if you're familiar with that, you'll know that there's a test called the glaucoma hemifield test, which looks at the sensitivity values in the upper hemifield compared to the lower hemifield. And in glaucoma, typically within an eye, you start to see some imbalance within the eye to give you an indication that all is not well. Uh, and we also see imbalance between the eyes as well. So we're looking for a symmetry or imbalance when we look on our glaucoma patients. Uh, and if you look on this hemisphere asymmetry map here, you can see these black boxes here are indicating they're at least 30 microns thinner than the corresponding location in the upper hemifield there. So we've got a suggestion that uh, uh, this, this eye may be glaucomatous. Now we can segment all of the layers of the retina and we can look on the individual ganglion cell layer. Uh, and the average thickness in this very thick part of ganglion cell layer paraphobally here is about 50. Early 50s is what I look for. And you can see in this patient, actually, they're super thick up here. We've got snow-capped mountains, and we've got values of 58, 59. But if you look down here, we've got a notching. We've got a value of 26 across the horizontal midline, and we've got 46 superiorly. So we've got an imbalance. We've got an asymmetry. And the hot spot from the point of view of the ganglion cell layer is this temporal side of this ring or donut, if you like, of thick parafoveal ganglion cell. And glaucoma typically comes in from the temporal side. It follows the horizontal midline, and you start to see some imbalance or some notching across the horizontal midline. So I've got a 20 micron difference between the superior box here compared to the inferior. So a very clear indication of some notching. And in the early stages of glaucoma, it looks like uh, a snail shell from that point of view. Um, so I'm looking at these information from the rim to the nerve fiber layer to the ganglion cell layer, uh, and I'm starting to formulate in my head that this really looks like a glaucoma model eye. Uh, there's three components that all seem to fit together to suggest that. Uh, and if I'm not so sure, um, I can look now on the deviation map. And the deviation map is a more recent introduction. And what we do is we look at all of the thickness values across this posterior pole scan, and we start to compare them to normal. So here's our thickness map with our snail shell here pattern, and here's our deviation map. And this is more like a traffic light system. So we've got green for within normal limits, we've got yellow for borderline, and we've got red for outside normal limits. Um, and I've been used to looking at uh, this notching of ganglion cell here around the fovea and looking uh, across here up to now, uh, now we've got the deviation map, uh, you appreciate actually 
the damage to the ganglion cell is much further out temporally. And you see how it follows that horizontal midline and starts to come around the fovea. Um, so uh, we've got more information to help us if we look on the deviation map. And if you then uh, link that up to the nerve fiber layer, here's the nerve fiber layer deviation map. You can see that blue river going to the lake there in the thickness map, and you can see that arcuate defect on the deviation map. So those tie up together anatomically. There's the nerve fiber, there's the ganglion cell. That all ties up. Uh, the axons exit the optic nerve there. And if you look on the full retina, you just get an appreciation of that focal nerve fiber defect that we saw um, on the infrared reflectance image at the beginning. So uh, it's a holistic approach. And I can assure you that if you look at all the aspects available to you with your OCT, firstly, you're going to be much more confident uh, that you actually have a glaucoma eye uh, if you're suspicious of it, or you're going to be a little bit more confident that you see different patterns. Uh, and we'll look at those uh, in a little while. I'll show you some non-glaucoma cases. Uh, you're going to see different patterns that suggest that you need to think outside of the box of glaucoma, and maybe possibly you've got uh, some neuro-ophthalmology, uh, non-glaucomatous optic neuropathy present. So I hope that um, kind of gives you the idea of this systematic approach. Um, and finally, you may be able to correlate your OCT with your visual field. So if we pick up the visual field of this patient, I've loaded the visual field here. Here's the 24-2 Humphrey field. Um, and you can see that there's a very early superior nasal step um, showing up on the visual field. Uh, and what you need, and maybe those of you who have worked with visual fields know, um, that your visual field is uh, inverted and it's upside down relative to your OCT. So if you see a superior nasal defect on your visual field, that is going to correlate with an inferior in other words, inferior to the horizontal midline and on the temporal side uh, of, uh, of the OCT, um, let's say around the fovea. So that ties up uh, between the visual field and the OCT. And in fact, in the OCT, it looks to be a little bit more advanced. So in the earlier stages of glaucoma, you might uh, benefit from seeing uh, changes on your OCT that are not yet obvious on the visual field and could be pre-parametric. So let's move to a slightly earlier stage glaucoma. And we've got a patient here presenting uh, to the clinic with pressures of 20, IOP of 20, which is kind of borderline, uh, considered a borderline pressure, although all pressures are, are probably relevant depending on the patient. If I extract my uh, fundus image there, I can see the disc very nicely. I can also see if I think about cut disc ratio, a borderline cup disc ratio. This looks like a 0.5 cup disc ratio. The patient has got some peripapillary atrophy here, uh, and the vessel trunk looks to be in a nice C curve. Um, if you are very sharp, eagle eyed, and used to looking on fundus images, and I've had a couple of uh, doctors tell me, um, is there something going on down inferiorly? And I say, ah, oh, well, you must have very good eyesight because there is actually a little bit of a dull area here following parallel to that vessel. Uh, it's not very obvious, but if you go to your confocal multicolor, this shows you again the advantage of the ability to see nerve fiber defects. And you can see clearly that dull nerve fiber defect in your confocal multicolor image following that vessel. So we've already got an indication before we even look um, on our OCT. Now, if we look systematically from the rim, Let's see here. Um, we've got a disc size, according to the anatomy here, 2.22. So again, it's an average size disc. Uh, and I would expect the patient's neuroretinal rim to follow the green line uh, in the middle of that normative range. And I'm afraid, again, it doesn't. The patient has a little depression here, kind of nasally, but a much larger depression, wide depression here, going nasal inferior, temporal inferior. Um, and I don't like the look of that rim. Uh, so one strike for this patient, I'm afraid, thinking about OCT in respect of glaucoma. If we go to the nerve fiber layer, you can see again beautifully with your spectralis, the real tissue of the nerve fiber layer here. 
Uh, it's quite thick. It's not really uh, also uh, necessarily a double hump situation, but we know that it's segmented well. And that means we can be very confident about this nice incline up to that superior uh, hump there. But if we come across here to our inferior hump, we can see we've got quite a deep little focal notch. And if I move that cursor away, you can see how the tissue is pinched together there. We've got really a nasty little focal nerve fiber defect showing up there. Uh, and if you look at that location, that is exactly the location where we've seen that focal nerve fiber defect following that vessel. Uh, if you are very smart looking, you'd have seen it on the infrared, but certainly in the, in the confocal multicolor, you can see that. And look here, it's not showing up in the sector analysis. And so that's why uh, if you're not looking on the profile today, encourage your doctors to start looking on the profile because this is a much more sensitive start point for evaluating whether or not uh, your patient looks like they might have a problem. This is a very rough guide when you look on the sector analysis. So I'm afraid not looking good. Two strikes for this patient from an OCT perspective, um, thinking about glaucoma. Let's go to step three, uh, and let's see whether we've got any notching of our ganglion cell inferiorly that fits with that nerve fiber defect. If we look at our posterior pole scan, uh, we've got nice hot colors in here, nice thick retina up here, but we've got dark colors, purple and blue down here, which suggest a little bit thinning. And this is the area of concern. This is where that focal nerve fiber defect is. So it looks a little bit like the sea starting to come in and flood the land there. Um, it's not scientific. It's purely pattern recognition. But if you look up here, we've got a thick bundle of superior fibers here, and we've got snowcat mountains. So very thick fibers superiorly, but we don't have the same inferiorly. So we've got an imbalance just looking at those fibers, um, for example. Um, and if you look at the asymmetry map, we've got an imbalance. We've got uh, thinner values down here in the lower hemisphere compared to the upper hemisphere. So again, there's another suggestion um, that this may be a glaucoma eye. Uh, if we look at our ganglion cell layer, this is very interesting because now we've got a very nice circle of parafoveal ganglion cell. Beautiful donut. It's got icing on the top, or if you like, snow cap mountain, I call it because it gives you uh, more uh, an impression of elevation. Um, and we've got 53.55 in the hotspot here across the horizontal midline. So to all intents and purposes, that ganglion cell layer map looks to be normal. And how is that? Um, and I've been asked uh, several times by uh, clinicians over the last few months, um, you know, often I see nerve fiber defects and yet the ganglion cell seems to be normal. Is that normal? Um, well, I have to tell you, in my experience, uh, is very common. Uh, and that suggests that actually, indeed, the origin of glaucoma is in the optic nerve and comes out through the, through the axons and finally arrives to the ganglion cell, uh, if that's the commonly held belief of the pathophysiology of glaucoma. But it really doesn't matter. If you believe that the ganglion cells go first, that's okay too, because we look at everything. But from this example, it appears we have a nerve fiber defect here, and yet the ganglion cells seem to be preserved. Now, here's where the added value comes from the deviation map, because if you look on the deviation map, we get more information. And the deviation map suggests that indeed there is some change of ganglion cell layer, but it's right out here temporally. It's not in this parafoveal ring where we're looking for it. Um, and if you then look to the nerve fiber layer, you see, in fact, that nerve fiber layer defect is right down here peripherally. Um, and that makes sense now that you look at them together because um, these axons are not meeting up in the center here where we're expecting to see ganglion cell loss. They're very peripheral and they're meeting the ganglion cell right out there peripherally. So now that makes much more sense. And we weren't aware of that we, before we had the deviation map. So this is an additional value for me, at least looking on that. And you can see that purple river there on the thickness map going to the lake, that little focal defect. And if you look at the retina, you just get a little hint that there's a little slither uh, of damage here 
uh, on the nerve fiber. So uh, for me, this holistic approach, looking at all the information together, is really, really valuable, especially looking at these ganglion cell maps, because I know uh, that in many departments, uh, they're not looking on ganglion cell maps yet. And this is really important today. And we'll show you why, because when we come to non-glaucoma, you'll see that the patterns are different. Uh, and even early ganglion cell loss uh, appears to show up earlier than nerve fiber defects. So it's very, very important uh, that you start looking on ganglion cell maps. Third glaucoma case is a, a moderate glaucoma case, um, and we have a visual field here which has got a little bit more advanced superior defect here compared to uh, that first case. Uh, this is the old HEP that some of you may recognize, um, sadly is gone. Um, now if we look at our OCT uh, again from the rim, systematically every single eye, uh, we have a, a rim area here, sorry, a BMO area here, 1.81, which again is in the, in the uh, average size uh, of disc. We've done our follow-up, so let me go back to the baseline there. Um, now, this patient should follow the green line in the middle of the normative range. He, he does pretty much until we come to this part here, a temporal inferior area here. I don't like the look of that. That's almost in the outside normal limits area there. Uh, and you'll again notice nothing showing up in the sector analysis. So uh, I rest my case that uh, really important that you look on these profiles first because that's more sensitive than this sector analysis. Uh, I don't like the look of this rim, so one strike. Uh, thinking about glaucoma from an OCT perspective. If we then go to the nerve fiber, you can see the nerve fiber very clearly. It's looking a little bit sad and thin over here in this temporal inferior area again, and we've got a large chunk out of that temporal inferior hump. It's sufficiently large to be flagging up here uh, on the sector analysis map. So that tells you how big that area is. So two strikes for this patient. Thinking about glaucoma with our OCT. I don't like the look of the profile of this nerve fiber layer. Finally, we can go to the uh, posterior pole. And if we look on our thickness map here, we see again a different pattern compared to the other patterns that we've seen. A lot more purple. The sea has come in and flooded the land completely. We've got a massive great big river going to the lake here, almost like an estuary. And now you can see that half your hemifield of ganglion cell has gone, even you looking at the, uh, the full retinal thickness map. And if you look at the asymmetry map here, there's a very obvious asymmetry between the upper hemifield and the lower hemifield. These black boxes are 30 microns thinner than the corresponding location up here. So we've got a much clearer indication that this eye is not well. Uh, and if you look at the ganglion cell layer, you've got a complete horizontal loss of ganglion cell layer, layer there inferiorly. Um, and so uh, that's pretty conclusive. Uh, and if you needed any more confirmation, if you look on the deviation map, we'll see again, very, very temporal start of damage here in glaucoma. It comes in, follows the horizontal midline and starts to come around the fovea. So this is a more moderate case of glaucoma compared to the previous cases. And look at the nerve fiber layer. You can see how the ganglion cell layer hooks up to the nerve fiber layer axons and exits the optic nerve there. So it's pretty conclusive. And there's your retina, which is showing aspects of nerve fiber defect and also ganglion cell defect. So we've got the whole picture and we can be much more confident in our analysis uh, of our OCT. And that's what I try to teach our doctors. Um, and just come back to the posterior pole for one minute uh, and look at the posterior pole map again of the right eye, which is damaged. And think about the inter-eye asymmetry, because in glaucoma, more often than not, you're going to see damage in one eye before the other. So we're looking for asymmetry not only within the eye, but we're looking for asymmetry between the eyes as well. So look at the difference in patterns. We've got a clear uh, difference between the right and the left eye. The left eye is looking more normal, although there seems to be the sea starting to come in here and clip the land. And it looks as though we might have some superior uh, 
uh, imbalance and the superior asymmetry compared to that inferior hemifield there. And then if you look at the comparison of the ganglion cell, there's the right eye, which is bad, and here's the left eye. And the left eye looks a nice ring of ganglion cell, thick snow-capped mountains, and we've got 53, 57. So it's just the comparison that you see visually. It's very dramatic, but this is, a, again, another sign that this patient is looking more like glaucoma. Now, what if you think you've got a glaucoma, but your OCT is allowed to tell you that uh, maybe you haven't? Let's have a look at this patient. Um, is a patient considered glaucoma since 2001 and on medication? And if you look at the optic nerves, you can see that they both eyes are very cupped out, very thin neuroretinal rim. So you can understand why. Uh, perhaps he was put on medication for glaucoma. But if we look to our OCT scan, again, from the rim, you can see he's got a 2.11 disc size according to our anatomy here. So he's an average disc again. But look at the position of the neuroretinal rim. Absolutely diffusely thin down here. He should be at the green line. Uh, and at this time, he was only 42 years old. So he's relatively young for a glaucoma patient, really. Um, so something's happened. Um, and if you see such a thin neuroretinal rim, you might expect that you'd see a thin uh, nerve fiber layer. But in actual fact, it's not too bad. If you look at it physically, uh, he's got double humps. Maybe it's a little bit thin here temporally. Uh, and this is a very key point. You can see that there's temporal thinning here and temporal thinning here uh, from superior to inferior here. Uh, and when you see temporal thinning, just ask yourself the question for one minute, well, that may be related to glaucoma, uh, but we know that temporal thinning also very much relates to non-glaucoma. So we see nasal temporal changes rather than superior inferior changes that we expect in glaucoma. So typically MS patients, for example, will show nasal temporal changes rather than inferior superior changes. And so we've seen temporal change here, um, which is interesting, and that's flagging up in the sector analysis there. Um, now, if we look to our posterior pole, let's see what the retinal thickness map looks like. And we've got a funny pattern. We've got purple eye. And when you see purple eye, start to consider that you've got a thin atrophic retina. Why? And the first question to ask yourself is, is the patient highly myopic and might naturally have a thin retina? Uh, and you can check the image information here. Uh, and we can see that the focus setting was minus 4.19 diopters. So he is myopic. Um, but he's only minus four, and minus four would still be included in the normative database. So it doesn't really explain why we've got a thin atrophic retina. So if you see purple eye, it's a warning sign. Why has the patient got a thin retina? Uh, has he had a, a vascular problem? Has he had a retinal vein occlusion, a retinal artery occlusion that could thin the retina? Or has he had an event of optic neuritis, neurological problem that would thin the retina? So we've got the sea flooding the land in here, creating an island. We've got this funny green crescent. We haven't got a circle that we're expecting to see of thick parafovial ganglion cell. And we've got no pattern. It's kind of just diffuse when we look at the asymmetry map. So it's not a glaucoma pattern at all. And if you then look to the ganglion cell layer, it becomes much clearer. You've got vertical ganglion cell loss. This is not a pattern of damage that you expect to see in glaucoma. In glaucoma, we're expecting the problem to come from the temporal side in, and we're expecting damage here. So not only is it not horizontal, it's in the wrong location. We've got thinning here between the fovea and the disc. This is nasal thinning. And so we've got two different types uh, of thinning here of the ganglion cell layer that's not fitting with glaucoma. And remember, this patient is, is diagnosed glaucoma and he's on glaucoma medications. And if you look to the fellow eye, the story unfolds. Um, we've got another example of the sea flooding the land. We've got an island created and we've got this funny green crescent here uh, temporally now in the left eye. 
no pattern of damage according to asymmetry, according to glaucoma. And then if you look at the ganglion cell, we've got homominous hemimacular thinning uh, in both eyes. And it's vertical. And this is not patterns that we would expect to see in glaucoma. Uh, and we can tell from the patterns what the problem might be. So we've got in the right eye here, nasal thinning from the fovea to the disc. But in the left eye, we've got temporal thinning from the fovea out. Uh, and if you look on the deviation map, uh, you can see where that damage is. And you've got almost side by side, right sided uh, loss uh, of ganglion cell there between the right eye and the left eye. And that tells you that this is a post chiasmic problem. It's a neuro ophthalmology problem and almost certainly a left optic tract problem or a left optic radiations problem just from these patterns of ganglion cell. Um, so um, this patient has had many Humphrey fields done uh, and apparently has clear fields. Unfortunately, I haven't got an example of it, but apparently he's got clear fields. Uh, and it would be very useful to see uh, a 10-2 program run uh, to see whether that fits much better to this small area that we see on the ganglion cell. Um, so I'll be very interested to see whether or not he had defects on 10-2. On um, and he subsequently said that he lost his vision for a day in 2003. And he's been examined numerous times. Nobody's been telling him anything about that. And I said to him, um, would you mind if we ran uh, our neurology program? Uh, let's see whether you've got any damage in your papilla macula bundle that might suggest uh, a neurological problem as well. Uh, and we ran the Ensight program. And you know that the Ensight program shows elements of elevation here. We've got light blue to show elevated structure. And we've got purple here to show outside normal limit structure. Uh, and then we also isolate the papilla macula bundle because in these cases of non-glaucomatous optic neuropathy, we see nasal temporal changes and particularly relating to MS patients, they lose nerve fiber in the papilla macula bundle and typically about two microns a year, which is similar to the average loss in glaucoma in the overall. So this patient, you can see that he's got completely thin rim. He's got a borderline papilla macula bundle there. And if we look to the nerve fiber layer, we can see this temporal loss of nerve fiber layer. And he's absolutely lost papilla macula bundle. And he's got nasal temporal changes. So these are not patterns that you associate with glaucoma at all. And if you look to the left eye, another giveaway is the fact that he's got bilateral loss. We don't expect that in glaucoma and except in very advanced cases. We expect an imbalance between one eye compared to the other. Here in non-glaucomatous optic neuropathy, you might see bilateral changes, very similar pattern. He's lost in the left eye completely the temporal nerve fiber layer, but actually his papilla macula bundle is still in normal, but he is showing nasal temporal changes. So obviously, this loss of vision in 2003 affected the right eye more than the left eye. But this is a neurologic pattern. This is not what we expect to see in glaucoma. And so he went away for an MRI scan uh, without contrast, uh, and he didn't find anything. Uh, and then he had uh, upped his private insurance, apparently, and he went back and he had an MRI scan with contrast, and this showed up. Uh, this white matter in uh, in his spinal column here. So this is a spinal problem. And now he's been diagnosed with neuromyelitis optica. So neuro-ophthalmology immune system problem, not glaucoma. Um, so the moral of the story here is with your OCT, uh, when you think sometimes you might have a glaucoma eye, if you look further and look holistically at everything, uh, you might discover actually the patterns of damage uh, look uh, completely different to what you expect for a glaucoma patient. And you have to think outside of the box of glaucoma and consider, is it really possible that I've got a non-glaucomatous neuro-ophthalmology problem? Um, Matthias, I've got one more case, but am I out of time now? Is that enough for you? Next it, yeah. Are you there? Are you there? <laughs> Hi, Martin. I'm here. And it's always Good. a pleasure to follow your cases. So when, 
when it's always uh, that easy in the glaucoma patient, that would be great. So since we have really several questions, uh, I would uh, ah, like okay. you to end at, okay. at this. And uh -huh. uh, I would suggest to do like rapid fire question and answer. So I ask Fine. the question and you t try to really yeah, quick sure. do, answer do the questions. You want me to stop sharing and yeah, and please come stop back sharing and, and show up your camera image. So that would be okay. a little bit nicer than these uh, images that All you right. showed up in I've at stopped, the second year. I've stopped sharing. I've stopped sharing. So I don't know whether we can you can recover me. So um, until you are ready and we'll see you, I ask the first question. So Martin, okay. um, what is the normal range for BMO area? The normal range for BMO area, um, it's between 1.5 and 2.5 millimeters squared. And I didn't talk about that, but uh, actually, if you have a small disc uh, with uh, a BMO area less than 1.5, all of your axons are squeezed together to try to get through that smaller hole and you'll naturally have a higher position to your neuroretinal rim. And on the other side, if you have a large disc, all of your axons are spread out and, and, and naturally you have more cupping because it's a larger area for them to go through. And you might have a lower profile to your neuroretinal rim with a large disc. Um, I don't see myself on there, don't you have to see me, but yeah, that doesn't uh, matter, Martin, but these values okay. are only your, your own approach, or is it something that we can read in papers? Uh, it is something uh, that I observe, but I think it's also um, in our uh, own teaching materials, if you yeah. have a look. I think there's examples in our own teaching materials as well, okay, and I so guess the references are in there. Uh, so, I think Professor Martin has done a paper confirming that as well. We have to speed up three minutes, six questions. Uh, okay, go on. Go on. So, uh, can the ganglion cilia be too thick? Is that possible? Yes, it is. And one of the problems with the deviation, not a problem, but one of the issues with the deviation map, and I've seen super normal patients with very thick ganglion cell, and they're flagging up blue and purple, and we have no limit on the thickening. So we don't know when a ganglion cell thickening is actually too thick, uh, than normal. That's one of the limitations that we have with the deviation map. But I think there should be no um, pathologic uh, correlation with it, right? No, it just, no. Uh, it just why, why is it swollen? Is it a general swelling of the retina because of some other condition? Yeah. So next question, uh, availability of deviation maps in the US. I don't think that we can t make any statements to that. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, me either. Okay. Um, so next one is optic distrusion and BMO. Can you set yeah. accurate the BMO positions in optic distrusion? It uh, depends on the on the patient, but more interestingly, uh, that's not really that important. What's important is that you, if you look at the radial B scans on that on that BMO scan, you see the drusen. The drusen are above the lamina, and you see those black holes, and you see the uh, the hyperreflescent artifact uh, uh, aggregates around the drusen. Uh, I can show you that if you want to have a look. I can show you an example of that if you want to see. I, I don't think that we have the time for that because only one minute Okay, the, BMO, the drusen, the BMO is not important. What's important after that, if you can see physically the drusen in the B scans, what's important is the patterns of damage that you see in the nerve fiber and the ganglion cell maps and the deviation maps. You see extensive thinning there. <laughs> Okay, next question. If a patient had a posterior vitreous detachment tugging on the nerve and changed the RNFL thinning on the baseline yeah. exam, do we follow up yeah. on that BMO scan as it is, or do we need to make a new reference? It might be okay, and it depends where the traction is. If the traction is affecting the BMO, uh, you might see it, and you know that it's not very good, or it might be okay. It just depends. And in those cases... Uh, again, everything might be disrupted because of the traction. You might even have stretch ganglion cell, funny ganglion cell maps as well. So it could be in some cases of traction, uh, you're really struggling uh, until that, it, unless that traction is actually released, and then you can start looking at a stable uh, anatomy. Yeah. 
Okay, great. Next one. Should the OCT established peripherality of the fiber defect influence choosing between 24-2 or 30-2 visual field? Uh, I'm more looking from the point of view of the, uh, the maps of the ganglion cell and the 10-2 field fits much better to the configuration of the ganglion cell paraphobially and that's what you want to correlate. It's a much better correlation. If you think about 24-2 fields, there's only four points that relate to that ganglion cell map and so that's the purpose of the 10-2 is really for looking at those early ganglion cell changes um, and the literature is saying that in many optic uh, non-glaucomatous optic neuropathies ganglion cell change seems to be earlier um, so that's where it becomes really important that we look on those ganglion cell maps and sometimes there's a time lag between the visual field uh, compared to the damage that you see with your OCT on the ganglion cell and the nerve fiber in these cases. So it's not always that you're going to see a correlation anyway. Um, as far as peripheral is concerned, um, the reason for the 24-2 field is that it was a compromise between doing a, a wider 30-degree 30, 30 field uh, compared to the time that you would save in doing, let's say, six degrees less. So that was a compromise, and that's the reason why 24-2 became a standard universally yeah okay great thank you for that next one can backbowing iris cause glaucoma or false anterior chamber readings can, can you say again sorry Matthias, can, say that again yeah can backbowing iris cause glaucoma or a false anterior chamber reading i don't understand Be becks bowing Beck, backbowing iris i've um i don't think if we have an image of that i think it's uh, when the iris is uh, curved like like this and moves um, to the bottom so, and then maybe the anterior chamber reading is, is wrong but we, when we have no answer on that we can switch uh, to the last question martin that doesn't matter and okay last one is, is only a personal preference question i think um so is, is it better to have black or white uh, background on the oct images i think, oh, I, I think that, yeah, it's personal preference. Um, yeah. I'm very used to looking at uh, white on a black background, to be honest, but some people like it the other way around because they're used to looking at histology slides. So it depends on your um, your background and what you were used to looking at when in earlier days, I think. Yeah, I think the but same. I, I, I certainly look on, on uh, white. White B scans on a black background is what I look at. Yeah, that's what I prefer as well. But uh, Ethan told the other way around in, in the lecture before, so it's really a personal preference. I think so. Yeah, I think so. Okay. So, great. So, we really got it. It's now three minutes um, after our official <laughs> end of the session, but we had really a lot of questions, and I'm really thankful for that. So, thank you very much for all your questions. We have now, again, a short break, 30 minutes break until we have the last session with anterior and anterior segment imaging with the anterior. So stay excited um, for the last session. See you.